announcing the events. Um, firstly, um, you might have heard of the three typhoons around Taiwan. So, um, luckily, the lucky part is that we have nicer weather, not so warm today. Um, but it's, it's predicted that the type, one of the three typhoons would actually pass through Taiwan. And um, typically, what happens is that um, the government, the city government, Taipei city government, would announce um, the day before if um, we would have work or classes the next day. So if the Taipei city government would announce that there is no work or there's no work and no class the next day in Taipei, then we would just cancel the activity of that day. Um, if possible, we would try to make it up, but um, it, it would be hard to make up the activity of the whole day. Uh, in some cases, the, the work will be canceled only for half day, and that, in that case, it would be easier to make it up. Um, so please pay attention and also use common sense. Even if the government announces that there will be work the next day, but if you find it very hard to get out, or if you see trees falling, um, you should still stay at home. Um, we, if, if we still have people here giving talks, we will tape it for you anyway. So um, be careful and pay attention to the Central Weather Bureau or to the web page. If there will be a um, cancellation of activity, we will also announce it on the web page and also by emails. And also, um, if you leave this uh, lecture hall for lunch or something, please um, remember to bring your personal belongings with you. Um, we, we, we don't have uh, people to watch over your stuff for you, so um, if you have computers or um, valuable stuff, please carry them with you. Okay, so um, the second lecture is to be given by Professor James Liu from Michigan University, and the title is Compactations and Consistent Truncations in Supergravity. Let's welcome Professor Liu. Okay, great. Um, so, what I'd like to do is to bring uh, super, supersymmetry and supergravity into the mix with uh, general relativity. And so the plan was today to say sort of a few words and a bit of an introduction to uh, supersymmetry and supergravity. And then we'll move on to hopefully a little bit more fun stuff or whichever way you want to think about it, uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, when we start talking about compactifications, user climb reductions, and consistent <laughs> So although I have I have these slides prepared. Um, I welcome any questions. I feel it'd be great if you wanted to interrupt me if you had any questions at any time. So uh, if I'm just speaking too much, feel free to interrupt. Anyway, so um, I think we've probably heard a fair bit about supersymmetry. And one question is, well, why do we want to actually think about uh, supergravity or supersymmetry? And from a sort of a theoretical point of view, an interesting aspect of supersymmetry, it improves sort of high energy behavior of theories. And the classic example is something like the Higgs quadratic divergence. So supersymmetry is a symmetry between bosons and fermions. And they actually do a quantum calculation. Let's say you have a Higgs or a boson over here with a boson loop over here. So a boson running through a loop. At the same time, supersymmetry says you also have a fermion running through the loop. And the rules of quantum field theory, um, we have a fermion loop over here, we have a, a minus sign, and so the uh, divergences from here and here, at least the quadratic divergences, cancel. And so for unbroken supersymmetry, um, it's not exactly this diagram, we have vacuum, uh, vanishing vacuum energy. And it's just good things from a sort of a practical or phenomenological point of view in terms of sort of having a potential solution to the hierarchy problem. There's also uh, the idea of each particle in a supersymmetric theory has its sort of a super partner, and these super partners, at least the lightest super partner, could serve as a dark matter candidate as well. So it's very compelling, there are phenomenological reasons 
for supercentric. Let me introduce another one, of course, is that if you look at local supersymmetry, gauge theory of supersymmetry, as I'll explain later, that automatically uh, gives you a theory with gravity. So supersymmetry is also sort of nicely tied in to uh, gravity. And then, of course, uh, string theory or superstring theory is sort of uh, built in, uh, that's built in supersymmetry. And so if anyone's interested in doing string theory, then one of the important aspects is to understand supersymmetry and supergravity as well. Now, one thing about string theory is that the consistent theories, well, in general, let's say the consistent superstring theories uh, live in 10 dimensions, and yet we have a four-dimensional or a three plus one-dimensional observed universe. And so in order to do that, we often want to introduce what's called compactification, which is a way to sort of wrap up or hide six extra dimensions. So, so imagine taking a 10-dimensional string theory, I can leave three plus one dimensions large over here and have what's called a compactification manifold X6. Now there's some questions about that. One question is how do I choose the geometry of X6? I probably want it to preserve some supersymmetries, we want to keep some low energy supersymmetry in the theory. And so the idea of compactifications, at least one way to think about it, is it's a way of understanding how I can take a 10 dimensional theory or a higher dimensional theory and wrap it up and end up with a lower dimensional uh, theory as well. Now I should say there are other ways of dealing with these extra dimensions. We could live on a brain world, things like that. Um, but even when they think about sort of uh, brain world physics, then sort of the tools of compactification, even if it's a non-compact space, tend to be very similar. And another fun aspect of compactification oops, is from a more formal point of view, is you can actually relate theories in different dimensions. Now, when I started you know, to think about string theory, I first heard about 10 dimensions, I got very excited, but then it took me a long time to sort of visualize extra dimensions. But once you get to do that, then it's sort of fun to think we can actually jump between different dimensions and have a way of relating theories with different dimensions. And that leads to sort of questions about whether we can have a sort of a unification of theories or maybe a sort of an M theory that ties everything back together. Well, it's just a few brief words of introduction. Let me actually say a little bit more about supersymmetry. Well, one thing I should say is uh, this it's sort of an overview of supersymmetry. I won't be able to get into all the sort of intricate details. I don't expect everyone to all of a sudden be an expert on supersymmetry from one lecture. So the idea is just to uh, have a bit of an overview. And I believe the slides and the talk will be available. So it's not that you have to write down every equation that I'm displaying for you, but just to get some idea of what's going on. But to think about supersymmetry as a symmetry of space time. Let me start with the uh, familiar Poincaré algebra, which is sort of the Lorentz symmetries over here, uh, attached to uh, translations. And sort of the famous theorem by uh, Coleman and Medulla more or less tells you that uh, if you want to have additional symmetries, the best you can do in this case is to have the sort of a Poincaré symmetry and a sort of internal gauge theory, uh, gauge symmetry, that there's no additional sort of space time symmetry. So I say, well, that's the end of the story. However, we know supersymmetry <coughs> evades that by using what's called a graded Lie algebra or by using fermionic symmetries in addition to the standard bosonic curve. And so to extend the Poincare algebra into sort of a supersymmetric case, I introduced supersymmetry generators which I'll call super translations. And the supersymmetries, um, there's different ways of doing things. I'm going to use sort of a uh, four component Majorana notation. This is four dimensional supersymmetry, just to give you a concrete example. And so basically, you have these uh, supersymmetric generators that are Majorana or spin one half objects. And I use it 
anti-commutators since they're ferromagnetic objects, and two supercharges anti-commute to give you a, a translation. And that's why sometimes I think about it as sort of a square root of translations or a super translation as well. Now under Lorentz transformations, the supercharges transform a spin one half, that's what the second line tells you, and they commute with ordinary translations like that. So this is the level of the algebra. But one thing this tells us is if I realize a supersymmetry, a supersymmetric theory, if I have a bosonic state and I act on it with a supercharge, then since it's a fermionic generator, it gives me a fermion. Likewise, if I have a fermion, I act it on it with a supercharge, I get a boson. So this is the reason that supersymmetry relates bosons and fermions together. So particles in a supersymmetric theory basically are organized into what might be called supermultiplets. And each supermultiplet has an equal number of bosons and uh, fermions. They also, because it competes with the momentum generator, uh, in the Poincaré case at least, the um, particles all have the same mass, but they have different spins. Let me just continue with the same algebra I wrote down over here, which is called n equals 1 algebra. And if you look at representation theory, you find out that the representations of superstructure are either massless or massless. And just as a quick sketch of how things work, let me start with the massive representation of supersymmetry. If the particle is massive, I can choose to go into this rest frame. So I choose this four momentum to have the mass sitting in a time like direction. Now I write down the uh, supersymmetry algebra over here. Since I've picked only P0, the time component over here, the right hand side is just the, based on the mass times this gamma zero. C is the charge conjugation matrix over here. This is a little bit of a mess, but if I think about it as uh, alpha and beta or spinner indices that run from one through four, the right hand side is a four by four matrix. It has non-zero eigenvalues. I can actually diagonalize that. And so I could to change this thing over here into basically the algebra of creation and annihilation operators, fermionic creation and annihilation operators. And I have two creation operators. So the way to do representation is to start with something like the initial vacuum state over here, which is annihilated by the annihilation operators. I can create with the Q1 dagger, Q2 dagger, or both at the same time. Because these are fermionic operators, the representation stops over here. And so if the starting point is spin j, this is basically adding angular momentum 1 half to spin j. When you add angular momentum 1 half, you get spin j plus 1 half, spin j minus 1 half. And then this over here brings you back to spin j. So a representation of massive supersymmetry has basically two particles of spin j. And then particle spin j plus one half, spin j <coughs> minus one half. At least for j bigger than or equal to one half over here. And so this is another, it's an explicit realization to see that a supermultiplet contains particles with angular momentum, uh, with spins differing by one half. the same thing for massless representations of supersymmetry. But in a massless case, you can't go into the rest frame, so you can choose to have like a light-like momentum. I just chose it into the z direction for our convenience. When you do that, right-hand side of the supersymmetry algebra has both a p0 term and a p3 term. If I do some clever factorization, I can write it as sort of 1 plus gamma 0 gamma 3 over 2 something. Like that. And again, remember this is a 4 by 4 matrix, except this time it has two zero eigenvalues and two non zero eigenvalues. That means uh, a pair, two of these uh, supersymmetric generators are actually uh, create null states, and only two of them are active one creation, one annihilation operator. And now representation theory is much easier. You just have a sort of ground state and one creation state that can change the helicity. Uh, that one half unit. So supersymmetry always relates things 
by one half helicity or one half spin. And sure enough, in the massless case, that's what happens. Now, in physical theory, I usually want to include the CPT conjugate states. So I end up with four states with helicities lambda plus one half, lambda minus lambda, minus lambda minus one half. I can think about that as a massless spin lambda particle and a massless spin lambda plus one half particle. Let me just write down a table of uh, massless representations, at least the ones that people will basically use. And so I label helicities up here. And this is the number of states of that helicity. So the basic idea is you have a chiral multiplet, which has helicities one half and two helicities zero and helicity minus one half. One, two, one should be familiar. Those are binomial coefficients. We'll see that uh, in extended supersymmetry as well. You can have supersymmetry that relates to this be one half and to this be one, which is sort of a vector multiplet, and then a CPT conjugate over here. You can go up to uh, three halves and one. So this is the biggest uh, spin or helicity with three halves, it is sort of a gravitino, and then you can go up to spin two. And I can keep, keep on going to higher spins, but I'm going to stop at spin two. For some of the same reasons that uh, Rachel mentioned, that interacting theories massless in both spin two are sort of uh, an issue. Now, even the gravitino multiplet can be a little bit suspicious because if I have an additional spin three has gravitino, then maybe I should go into what's called extended supersymmetry, which I mentioned briefly. So, if I ignore the gravitino multiplet, the basic multiplets are the chiral vector and graviton multiplets like that. Let me give you an actual example of how things work in a supersymmetric theory. Let me just consider a free chiral multiplet. And conventionally, we'll write this using uh, sort of a vowel notation or, you know, uh, two component spinner notation. But uh, I've chosen just to go to the four component Majorana case. In this case, the Western Union multiplet has a skater, a pseudo skater. These are real skaters and pseudo skaters, and a Majorana Fermion. Side. And the Lagrangian is very simple. For the free particle, I just write down a free interaction, uh, sorry, a free Lagrangian. And everyone knows a bosonic this scalar particle is one half d phi squared. I have two scalars, phi one and phi two. And then I write down a Dirac equation for my fermion, like that. And here's the fun thing about supersymmetry is you can actually write down the transformation, which is a transformation between um, the bosons of fermion. So if I take the boson phi 1, if I act on it with the supersymmetry, I create the fermion psi. Epsilon here is the spinner parameter of supersymmetry. There's four Qs, Q1, Q2, Q3, Q4, the four components of the Majorana supercharge. And epsilon tells you basically which component or which linear combination you're picking. Likewise, phi 2 transforms into the same fermion. There's only one fermion psi, so phi 1 and phi 2 both have to transform into psi, except the transformation is a little bit different. There's the chirality gamma phi matrix over here. The fermion has to transform into the boson. Well, there's two bosons, so psi transforms into a combination of phi 1 and phi 2. It's a little bit interesting because there's a inverse operator over here. A gamma mu d mu is just like this gamma mu d mu over here. Sometimes you can call it the Feynman slash or something like that. But this is not gamma mu d mu acting on a spinner. The derivative is acting on phi 1 phi 2 the scalars. Uh, but nevertheless, it has that kind of structure. So you see, uh, bosons transform into fermions. Fermions transform into a derivative of bosons. Just like that. So given the supersymmetry, let me demonstrate to you that the Lagrangian is in fact invariant under supersymmetry. And the way to do that is to actually do a transformation. So I, I start with the bosonic Lagrangian, which is sort of d phi d phi. If I transform it, I say the change delta L over here, well, I can have a delta phi 1 or a delta phi 2 term over here. I got rid of the fact one half of my Lagrangian. 
because I have two fines. It can either delta here or delta there. I only wrote down one copy of that. Then you just plug in a supersymmetry over phi one is basically uh, I epsilon bar uh, phi over here. This derivative here is the same derivative over here. You do the same for phi two. You end up with a combination like that. Now think about this inside the action, which means I'm integrating uh, the Lagrange intensity. So I'm going to go ahead and integrate my parts, take this mu phi to the other side, and I get box phi basically. Now I can also look at the variation of the fermionic part of the Dirac equation over here. So I'm using the fact that these are my runner, so again, I can vary psi bar back from the very side, that gives you a factor of two. So I just vary delta psi over here. Delta psi, remember, transforms as derivative of boson, which is this factor over here. Now this is all done in the Minkowski space. So this uh, e slash squared over here gives you box. You end up with this expression, which looks more or less like this expression. This is box phi, this is also box phi. Except the way I wrote down the transformations, this is epsilon bar on the left, this is epsilon on the right. So I actually have to flip that a little bit and end up with that result. And now you can look, the variation of the bosonic and the fermionic part cancels and gives you zero. So it's a very cheap result. It basically it works. Now I can do a little bit more than just look at the uh, variation of the action. I can also look for a realization of the supersymmetry algebra, or closure of the algebra. So I have transformations of phi 1, phi 2, and psi. I can do two supersymmetries on the fields. So if I do a commutator uh, delta 1, delta 2, it means I do two supersymmetries on phi 1, and you work it out, this is what you get over here. So delta, delta 1 is a transformation with parameter epsilon 1, delta 2, it's a transformation with parameter epsilon 2. And so it organizes into what I call C mu over here times D mu phi 1. And you see, a, hopefully, you see the pattern that a commutator to super symmetry is actually in a field. It gives you this factor 2 C mu D mu times the field itself. Now, D mu basically is the momentum generator. And so this is the realization of the algebra just like that. And if I didn't make a mistake, the factor 2 even comes out over there. Now, if you look at psi over here, the fermion, it's a little bit trickier because you have the sort of the translation term over here, you have an expositional term over here. You just do the supersymmetries, this is what you get. However, if you impose the Dirac equation, this is d slash psi over here, the Dirac equation for the free Western unit case over here, this is equal to zero, and then I ignore that so called Amschel. So, in fact, this is a realization of Amschel. Supersymmetry. And for all that, for all of you who've actually looked at this more carefully, you know I can introduce an auxiliary field and then I can have an offshore realization as well. So that's just some of the basic features. It's to say it two supersymmetries gives you a translation, one supersymmetry is something like the square root of translation. Now what I said is sort of elementary supersymmetry, or another way to think about it is rigid supersymmetry or global supersymmetry. I can actually promote that to a local symmetry. And just like we talk about sort of gauge theories of sort of a local symmetry, I can say what if instead of a uh, constant supersymmetry parameter, I had a space-time dependent epsilon over here. And the fun thing when I do that is I go back to sort of this, this idea of the algebra, delta delta of the field is uh, the two supercharges back in the field, which now gives me this parameter, C mu, which is space time dependent times D mu field. So if you think about this over here, this is basically doing a general coordinate transformation on the field. And so the idea is local supersymmetry 
And Cardi algebra basically tells you that your theory has to have general covariance. And sort of a general covariance theory is basically a theory that includes gravity. So you led to supergravity and led to uh, gravity as well. So when I say local symmetry, usually I think of a gauge theory or a gauge symmetry. When I have a gauge theory, then there should be some sort of a gauge field. And just like in a Maxwell theory, when you have a vector potential, that's a gauge field. Here I have a gauge field, but it's a supersymmetry gauge field, and that is the gravitino. The spin theory has gravitino has sort of a gauge invariance associated with it and serves as a supersymmetry sort of gauge field. So if I like the idea of local supersymmetry and supergravity, let me just show you a sort of a probably the most basic supergravity theory, which is n equals one supergravity in four dimensions. And so gravity theory should have a metric and I said I should also have a gravitino uh, side mu over here. Alpha here is the spinner index. Well, it turns out if you're doing spinners in curved space, you have a bit of a complication that you have to deal with, which is you need to have a covariant derivative of a spinner. And that needs to be done with a local, local Lorentz crank or a spin bundle. And so you really need to introduce what's called a veal bind uh, for gravity, which is. Uh, sort, sort of like the square root of the metric, if you wish. So mu is my space time index, a is my local Lorentz or tangent space index. Anyway, these are some details, and if you just want to think about it as a G mu new metric and a gravitino sine mu, that's perfectly okay. But technically, you actually have to introduce any F frame field. Anyway, so the Lagrangian of supergravity is two parts. I have a graviton and a gravitino, so there should be a gravity action and gravitino action. The gravity action is just a familiar einstein hobart uh, term over here, which I'll just take in its full nonlinear glory. And then the spin three has uh, a Grangian is basically a generalization of the Dirac equation. Sometimes it's called the Rarita Schringer uh, equation, which is something like you know, psi bar gamma d psi with the appropriate tensor indices. In place of and I should say that what I wrote down over here is the uh, lowest order term. The actual supergravity is slightly more complicated because of supercovariantization. Anyway, supersymmetry should be a transformation between bosons and fermions. And so, so I need a transformation between gravitons and gravitinos. The gravitino to transform into graviton. The graviton is in some sense hiding inside the covariant derivative over here. Epsilon now is a local supersymmetry parameter. That's what becomes an X. The transformation of the Beer binder to gravi graviton is given by into the gravitino, kind of like that. You see the same sort of pattern. Transformation of boson to the fermion, transformation of fermion to the derivative. Um, So once again, if I wrote out the transformation rules like this, I should be able to ask, is the Lagrangian actually supersymmetric? And so we can actually check that. And so again, we vary two things. We can vary the bosonic part, which is the einstein hobart action. So this is all more or less done inside the action. If I vary the einstein hobart action, I got basically the Einstein tensor. I was guaranteed to work. That's why you get Einstein's equations out of it, times delta g mu nu. Well, delta g mu nu can be written in terms of the gravitino, like that. That's the easy one. I also have to vary the uh, gravitino term over here. And so I had a delta psi over here. I plug in delta psi, which is the epsilon, into the next one. This is done in an arbitrary background. So I now end up with two covariant derivatives at the epsilon. However, there's notation hiding inside here. Gamma mu nu rho is the sort of anti symmetrized